Welcome to episode 269 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C++ developers by C++ developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co-host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing okay. Uh, any news you wanted to share? I don't think Anything so. Anything going on? No? Sometimes when you say that, you're, you're prompting me to, to say something, and I'm like, um, <laughs> what did I forget? What did I forget? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Yeah, just uh, just another week. Uh Nothing going on? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, at the top of the episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, uh, we got an email about a recent show we did with uh, Ole Grabave. He said, uh, this is from Dirk Room, saying, Hey, guys, love listening to your episode about unit testing. I've been doing TDD at my company since 2013, and I'm glad to hear other proponents of unit testing. I agree with just about everything Oleg said, except we differ about the best use of mocking. If you want the best take I've seen on the subject, you should have Justin Searles on the show. You can check him out at blog.testdouble.com. And then he also pointed us to uh, this particular blog post saying it's an example of him demonstrating good mocking practices. So I will put that in the show notes. And uh, yeah, we, we have not done an episode specifically on mocking. We certainly talked about it uh, with Oleg a bit, but uh, maybe that is something we'll follow up on. I think interviewed we know two people that have made mocking frameworks that we have interviewed peter bendel and bjorn faller and i know we've talked about mocking with those episodes but i also agree that i feel like it's not really a topic that i really get Mm -hmm. yeah yeah something we can definitely uh do sometime in the future well we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show you can always reach out to us on facebook twitter or emails at feedback at speakast.com and don't forget to leave us a review on itunes or subscribe to us on youtube joining us today are lukash berkey and julio marino uh Lukash, after a number number of diverse jobs with computers, including Linux system administration and GPS navigation devices, Lukash has been working at Google in the Bazel team since 2009. In this decade, he has worked on almost every part of it, integration with remote execution, Android builds, its internal dependency management framework, internal telemetry, support for various programming languages, and a lot more. He played a significant role in creating Bazel from Blaze, its Google internal predecessor. Lukash, welcome to the show. Welcome. It's uh, it's nice to be here. Yeah, and Julio has been interested in build systems since the early 2000s. Such interest, interest started with frustrations over autoconf and automake and followed with amazement by what NetBSD and package source could achieve with a monorepo and a build system specially tailored to it. These adventures were continued with his own now dead build system, build tool, his own testing framework, uh, and his latter joining the Bazel team in 2016 Julio's been at Google for 11 plus years and is about to embark on some new challenges. Julio, welcome to the show. Oh, welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, it's, uh, both of you have spent, I mean, effectively entire careers thinking about and working on build systems. That's, I'm not sure what to say about that. <laughs> it's, it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by it. I don't know. I, I've never built my own build system. Uh, personally, although it does seem like it's a rite of passage for some people. They feel like, well, I have to prove that I understand how this all works at some point. <laughs> uh, I haven't yet. Actually, I haven't built my own. When I started, it was already, it was already there. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I'm afraid I, it may be a rite of passage, but then I haven't passed that test yet. <laughs> oh, I certainly haven't either. I've said, you know what, it's good enough that the other tools do what I need them to do. <laughs> at the point, I tried to write my own, and then I realized, hey, the other tools already do a good job at it, more than I would ever do. So let's stop my craziness. Um, so don't go that route. Try to not do that. How much but, time did you invest in build tool before abandoning it? Um, I was looking at the web page I posted yesterday. It's still online. I think it's about five years. And I was looking at the manual I wrote for it even. I was like, wow, I had a lot of time when I was a student. Uh, <laughs> it wouldn't happen today. Um, yeah. But it had to go. I mean, the code base was a mess, and Autocomp and Automake actually did a better job than I did at the time. <laughs> I, I know this is a, an absolutely terribly biased opinion, and it's certainly not 100% true, but if I see that a web, if a project is hosted on SourceForge, my immediate response is, oh, it's probably a dead project. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's warranted, but I have the same, uh, same intuition. 
Yeah. Well, I know it's not 100% warranted because a project that I know is in active development, CVP check, is still hosted on, on SourceForge. Okay, I should have said Pijadis, not intuition. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay, well, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on these, both of you, and then we'll start talking more about Basil, okay? All right, so this first Welcome. one we have... Uh, we obviously had CVCon recently. We, we talked a lot about the conference, uh, but there have been a number of trip reports uh, from various attendees. And this is a, a little collection of a few of them uh, on the CPPCon website. Uh, and also just to note that, you know, a lot of the videos are still going up for CPPCon. So I would definitely keep an eye on that. Uh, but yeah, several good trip reports here. Uh, was there anything you might want to call out from any of these, Jason? Oh, well, it's funny because I, I clicked on this link, obviously, because I'm reading the news for the day. And then I clicked on Connors, which is the first trip report listed. And mm -hmm. I got so sucked into reading Connors that I totally forgot that there was, you know, several others that I should have looked at <laughs> as well. But Connors is very well written and covers an awful lot of topics and goes back historically and is like, well, if you don't like this version of the talk, check out this other version of the talk from three years ago or whatever. Yeah, he's really good about that. Like, he points out, you know, if this video is not available yet, uh, you know, uh, then you might be able to go watch it on, um, you know, some other platform. I think he did that with, with Size Talk on building an intuition for composition. Yeah. Yeah. So, very, very good trip report. He also referenced one of your uh, recent polls, Jason. Yeah, I asked people if they were going to be working while attending CBPCon or not. And it seems... Yeah, the, a lot of people were were trying to do a normal day job while also virtually attending a conference, which, you know, had some impact, I guess, in how people experienced it. Yeah, certainly not ideal, but it's it's harder to get away when you're not physically at the conference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did either of you uh, virtually attend CPPCon this year? I wasn't even aware of what's happening, otherwise oh, no. I wouldn't have. But oh, I did not. I attended a conference recently that was remote only and didn't really get much value out of it, unfortunately. So uh, this uh, CPP con and uh, upcoming meeting C++ and what C++ on C, so a lot of the C++ conferences this year are using Remo, right? That's what it's called. Yeah. Right. And so it kind of gives you part of that, that hallway track, quote unquote, feel where you can interact with people and chat um, in between sessions, which uh, had helped a, a lot and making it feel more like a real conference. Yeah, which uh, online conference did you attend recently, Julio? I think I dropped by, one of them was Microsoft Build. Okay. Uh, and then I think we had some other internal stuff at Google uh, for mobile development. But they were, in one case, they were like live sessions, which were okay. In our case, internally, we're like pre-recorded sessions, which is like at the point I can watch the videos anytime. That right, was right. a feeling of confidence, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next thing we have is a post on r slash CPP. Uh, this is our CPP status update. Um, we, we briefly talked last week about... Uh, this uh, video that was posted uh, from Jean-Hid Manid, and it, it caused quite a lot of uh, chaos <laughs> amongst the RCPP community. Uh, so it was certainly worth knowing about. Um, some One of the moderators was temporarily removed, but has since been reinstated, and uh, it looks like they're going to try to you know, apply some new rules with, uh, with posting content here. Right, Jason? Yeah, and some more uh, put some things in place to make sure that they can respond to moderation issues more quickly. Yeah, I don't know. Is there anything else worth worth saying about all of this right now? Uh, just if you have an interest in the Reddit C plus plus community, it's a good conversation to read. I think. Yeah. Okay, and then this last one, uh, Jason, you posted this video about concepts in C20 from the Copper Spice YouTube channel. Yeah, we never really call attention to their channel, but they do good work and regularly produce uh, videos. So that's Barbara and Ansel, who we've had on before, and um, regular conference speakers, and 
they just posted an episode on concepts. Yeah, and I thought it was a, a pretty good tutorial of concepts in C plus plus twenty. They uh, highlighted a couple of things that I haven't seen uh, talked about too much elsewhere, like you know what they think are some of the better uses use cases for concepts. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Julio and Lukas, uh, let's get started talking about Basil. Could one of you give us kind of an overview about uh, about Basil as a build system, and maybe tell us why Google decided to build its own build system? Um, I would using something question, existing. Yep, I will take this question because I have a bit longer tenure on this project itself than Julio. Um, although when I joined, uh, it has already been the build system at Google. And the story here is that uh, at the beginning, uh, Google used Make, like almost everyone else at the time. But then as the, our, our core base new, grew, uh, we started hitting the limitations of Make. So then uh, we had a system that used Python scripts in files called Build that generated Make files. And then that was good enough for a while. And then that also started hitting its limitations. And that's where when Basil was started. And you can see a few of the of, uh, things. You can see traces of uh, why uh, of the bust of Basil in it still. For example, that's why the build files are Python-esque. And that's why some of the syntax is very similar to that of make. For example, the dollar parenthesis variable expansion thing. Or that's why we call uh, what Basil builds targets. OK. Um, so the go ahead, yeah. Uh, so uh, in short, I think the main motivation was the scalability. Okay, and and what makes Basil more scalable compared to something like Make? Um, I, I, compared to Make, I think that the main there are two differences. One is that uh, Basil imposes more structure because in Make files you can do pretty much anything. You can call out to shell at any time and the semantics are not very amenable to parallel execution and they are not very amenable to understanding um, one make file in a build or parts of a make file separately. Um, in contrast, uh, Bazel has a lot of structure and a large part of, uh, I think a large part of when converting from make to Bazel was to impose this structure on the make files. One thing I would add is that in make-based projects, it's very common to have recursive make invocations, right? So you have different mm-hmm. make files per directory, and then, yeah, if you're in a subdirectory, building from that is very fast, because make only has to load that single make file, and that's it. But then make doesn't have a global view of the project, right? And then it kind of track across multiple dependencies. So at Google, we had a gigantic make file that covered everything. And then, yeah, you start hitting points where your code base is too big, the make file becomes too big, and just parsing it takes, I think, minutes, two, even, just to run a make mm-hmm. invocation. Um, so Bazel does the same whole project view, but it's smarter in knowing when to read parts of the build graph again. It doesn't have to reload everything in every single invocation, right? And that makes it more scalable. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is why more structure is more useful. Because if you, if you have build up barriers in the data flow within the tool, you can determine that if some, some input changes, you can determine exactly what needs to be rebuilt and what can stay as it is. So I think maybe for a point of clarity for me, would we say that Bazel is a build system itself? Like, is it directly invoking GCC or is it a build generator? Like you were started, if I understand correctly, you said original versions of those tools actually generated make files. Does, so does, does Bazel directly invoke GCC or does it like generate ninja files or something else? That's a good question. Um, Bazel currently directly invokes GCC okay. or the other comp- or other tools. The reason why I said currently is that because every once in a while the idea comes up to make a Bazel generate ninja files and it wouldn't be that hard to implement. It's just we haven't found a very compelling use case for it. Okay. And also we have a pretty nice execution engine, so we think that we can do better than Ninja. <sighs> okay. Uh, so you just said, you know, Bazel is directly invoking GCC or, or other uh, build tools, but what other uh, languages uh, can Bazel compile? It's more than just C++, right? Um, a lot. Okay. Um, I think that, uh, Julio, please correct me if I'm wrong. I would say that the main two languages 
are C++ and Java, and this is what drove the development. Python is a close third, um, and over time, a number of other languages grew, uh, grew into Bazel. Um, we have Golang, we have Haskell, we have Dart, um, we have Scala, we have Kotlin. Am I missing something important? Fortran? Um, I mean, I'm missing Somewhat surprising. Apple. Internally, yes. Internally, we do Fortran. Right? You have all the oh, yes. Apple, Objective-C, Swift, uh, or whatever you want, really. I mean, that's one of the nice things of Bazel, right? Is that it's the couple from the languages. You can build anything you want with Bazel, really. Just like you can with Make. I mean, it's not, no different there. Um, but one thing that's probably good to clarify is that at Google internally, we've always had kind of some blessed languages that we kind of use globally. Um, so things like Haskell, for example, is no widespread inside Google. So our kind of functionality to do Haskell is not great. But that's where our community, or the open source community, can really help us because other teams outside of Google would really want to use these languages and can very easily extend Bazel to support those use cases where we haven't really put that investment in. So, and, and all the languages that you listed, I heard like 10 compiled languages and I thought I swore you said Python. Did you say Python? What, what, why, why would Python be a target? I'm so confused. <laughs> 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 That's a, a very good question. Um, um, the reason why we started supporting Python is that because, sure, you don't compile Python, but you need to execute it. And the, what we originally did was a very simple thing, is that to assemble a, a tree of all the Python files a binary needs and a little stub wrapper script to execute the Python interpreter in the exact way that the code needs to be executed. But then what happened after is that a lot of functionality grew around it. For example, we internally we can package Python files into a single binary. We call them par mm. files. It's very similar to PEX. Um, we can run tests. And since, we, since uh, running tests is a first class, has first class support in Bazel, it's important to also be able to run tests in Python. And over time, we grew linters and I think we also have a type checker, at least internally. And native dependence. Native, native dependence. Native dependence is too, yes. Right, that's the critical thing, right? You might want your Python scripts to depend on C++ libraries or whatever you want, right? right. And Bazel lets you couple those things very easily. Um, at least inside Google. I'm not sure if the external Python rules we have currently support that. It's a tricky aspect, and I'm not sure. Uh, it's it's not just that it's a tricky aspect, it's also people don't, uh, people have many different use cases. So the reason why life is more simple within Google is that uh, our code base is pretty uniform for a code base of this size. And if you want to use Python co uh, native code from Python, you pretty much have one blessed way to do it and you can support it. But that's not how the open source community works. So we can't impose one single thing on everyone. Okay. So I've heard you say a couple of times internally versus the public. Is there two different repos, one that's managed internally and one that's uh, the public repo, or is it all? Is there some something I'm missing here? Um, good question. Um, so the way this works is that the code base of Bazel and its internal incarnation Blaze is almost the same. Um, we have some code internally that we don't open source, mostly because uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, this is this is mostly about uh, about interfacing with internal tools or programming languages that don't exist that exist only within Google. And the way this works, that the wait a minute, of... <laughs> <laughs> you just said programming languages that exist only within Google, and that's the first I've heard anyone say anything like that before. <laughs> I hope I uh, no, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't give away a big secret. <laughs> we do have that, although. My personal opinion as a person who supports developers at Google is that uh, they didn't. So recently, I think that uh, I think that there aren't anything new uh, new in the last few years, and uh, a lot none of, of that would affect what we open source, right? Sorry, none of that would affect what we open source because that would just be like extensions that are Starlog and not native inside the Bazel code tree. Um, they still have some appendages in the oh, in okay. the Java code, unfortunately. We are working on removing them, but we are not done yet. We did we did remove uh, support for two of these in the summer. 
that was a great accomplishment. But for example, <laughs> our internal internal parallel execution engine or our internal telemetry, uh, it it doesn't make any sense to open source those, so we don't. Okay. And then unfortunately, we have some as part of the open sourcing project process, we kind of forked a few modules because it was easier to do it that way than having to abstract things out. Mm. And now we're still suffering from trying to clean those up, right? But those are where the differences remain. Either in some of the rules that might be slightly different, like Lukas was saying, we have special ways of building Python code internally. So the rules might differ in how they look externally internally and then how Bazel interacts with our internal production systems. But for the most part, everything else is shared. It's a unique code tree, code base. And yeah, what you see outside is what we use inside pretty much. Very cool. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about what Bazel does and does not support. Uh, is it a cross-platform build system? I, I know you make references to both Mac and Linux. It supports many things, I would say. I mean, Bazel, as far as I know, can run on a Linux machine, um, Mac OS, Windows. It is an unofficial FreeBSD port. Um, I think I've seen it also run on NetBSD. I actually, I know it runs because I tried to run it, but it had some rough edges, but that was like five years ago. So at this point, it probably runs better. We see a lot of fixes there. Uh, I mean, it's just a Java app, right? It has some native code, but if you can port that amount of native code, which is very limited, it should be able to run pretty much anywhere. As for what it can target, I know Lukash had a list of things he might want to add there, so I'll let him answer. Uh, my curious, um, uh, please go ahead. I will interrupt you slash add things to you, oh. to what you say. I mean, targeting, we can target, I mean, internally or externally, people have used Bazel to build um, embedded code, server code, mobile code. So that would include targeting Intel platforms, ARM, um, I don't know, whatever, really. It's a matter of defining how you invoke the compilers, really. Bazel doesn't have a say on what you want to do with what you're building. It's just whatever rules you use. Like if you look at the C rules, for the C or C++ rules, you have a tool chain definition that says how your compiler works, how to invoke the compiler, and then you can target that. Other rules, like Apple rules, for example, to build mobile apps are a bit more complicated because they have to care about different iOS levels, different watchOS, tvOS, whatever, and combine them in a way that generates you the right APK, sorry, IPA in this case, with the right <laughs> combinations of um, binaries. But again, it all depends on the rules. Bazel itself doesn't care. Uh, no, I, uh, I, I th from your words, I thought that you know, you know something that maybe I don't, but uh, I essentially agree with what you said. Um, it's mostly uh, Linux and OS X and Windows plus the mobile operating systems. So, but it does sound like you at least implied that it does have support for cross compilation, which historically can be a problem for the build system to find the dependencies, the cross compiled dependencies. Okay. Um, that's a big part of uh, what we are doing. I mean, if you think about it, uh, if you build for a iOS phone or for iOS device or for Android device, you can't help but to do cross compilation. Right. And uh, we put a lot of thought into making cross compilation work. And the way we do it is by either not using the headers and libraries that are installed on the system or making it very clear when, when we do. Okay. Uh, a, uh, I mean, the heritage of uh, Bazel is that it comes from a monorepo where all code that used to build and all, all dependencies are checked in. And uh, this, comes very, this comes very handily in this case. Because, we are, because the fact that we try not to reach out to the system, if you can help, is very ingrained into what we are doing. Right. So in the mono repo scenario, you, do, you don't really have the question of where do my cross-compiled dependencies live because you are compiling all of your dependencies at that moment. Correct. A very good example is what happened at Google 2012-ish, I believe. So we have this dis uh, distributed execution system and uh, we used to rely on the C++ compiler uh, in uh, installed on the dev workstations of developers and installed on each node of this execution system. But then people sometimes wanted to have a new, new version of the C++ compiler. And then whenever a new version came, uh, came, came out, we had to do this elaborate dance because before we were able to flip the default, we had to make sure that it's installed on the workstation of every developer. We had to make sure that it's installed on uh, every node of the remote execution system. And only after that could we flip the flag. 
So we decided that it's way too much uh, procedure. So and we decided to therefore just check in the C, the, the new C++ compiler. And that, at that point, uh, migrating to the new, new C++ compiler was just as simple as pointing Blaze to the new version. Mm. But just to clarify, this is how we do things at Google. Like we try to tell people that this is the model they should follow, like checking your dependencies, checking your tool chains into the tree. But part of the things that had to go into making Bazel work for the open source community was not forcing that model, right? People in Bazel want to use that install tool chain. So we have to add features to Bazel to make sure you could do that. And now Bazel, for example, when you run it, by default, it will try to find what your system compiler is and generate kind of this configuration logic that you need to tell Bazel where the, the compiler lives, it generates it automatically and you can use it from there. But if you want, and as what we recommend you to do, if you have a big project, is to check in your dependencies so that Bazel can have a global view of how to build your project. And, and you are, just to clarify, including your compiler in that list of dependencies. Yeah, I, that would, GitHub would be sad if every project had their <laughs> compiler checked in. <laughs> yes, no, I, I, there, there, I do realize that there's an impedance mismatch between what we think is best practice and what uh, and where the world is and right. what GitHub can live with probably. Um, but I'm going to uh, cover up here external dependencies, right? When you say check in in the tree, um, you can literally do that, right? You can git add your compiler and add it, but I think you could possibly tell Bazel, hey, this lives in a separate repository that we have defined here that's shared across projects and you could pull that in transparently. Yeah, I think you'd use git, L, git LFS, large file storage. I think That's you could a use that. Different way too, but Bazel has its own okay. external workspace handling process. And Lucas knows much more about this than I do. Um, um, but, yeah, but, instead, but instead, I will tell you another alternative to accomplish this, which is that you can tell Bazel to run every compilation step in a particular Docker container, which has a no set of no set of tools installed. And then you spare yourself the step of telling every, every one of your developers to install that particular version of the C++ compiler or Java compiler or what have you. Or even worse, tracking down issues that come from uh, version mismatches. It's pretty neat. So I, I'm, I'm, I apologize, I may be misunderstanding part of this, but it's been my understanding for like as long as I've been doing development that you never check into source control something that can be generated. You never check in generated files. Um, so I feel like I'm I'm hearing a little bit of a dissonance because it does sound like, and this is a, a off the track, I guess, at this point, but it does sound like you're kind of saying, no, we check in all of the things. And I don't know, does that include, I don't know, am, am I making sense? Is my question, my, my thought process sound weird? Um, makes sense. I mean, you're saying what you said about good practice, I agree completely. You shouldn't check in generated files. Okay. Um, I agree. I don't know if Luke has those, but uh, when, when we, have, we try to do usually is checking the sources, not the generate the build okay. binaries. Okay. Which, so the only binaries you're checking in then are the system dependencies, the compiler, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even then we have the sources too, but for bootstrapping reasons, right, you will need to check in yeah. the binaries at some point, but for only, only for the compiler and then everything else that we can build from source, we build from source, and then we rely on a remote cache to make sure not every single engineer is building the compiler every day for everything <laughs> they have to do, because it would take too long, right? And that's highly cacheable because it's the same version for weeks, essentially. And it will you use the, whole, the same compiler for an entire weeks at a hopefully, time? Hopefully. <laughs> I haven't checked. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's what they could expect. <laughs> You just mentioned uh, remote caching, and that's one of the big features of Bazel, right? The ability to uh, cache binary so that when you hit build, you're not actually rebuilding that much. Is that right? Um, I would not go as far as to say it's a feature of uh, Bazel, but it's what Bazel makes. What, it's, what, uh, it's something that Bazel makes possible. Because what Bazel can tell you is which files exactly your completion steps need. And then if you know that, you know what to include in your, uh, in your cache key. And Bazel has an interface for, a, for remote execution systems that uh, we use internally to run distributed builds, and we do heavily, heavily use this. I think that the cache hit rates nowadays are around 99%, 905%. Wow. So if that, 
if that stopped working, um, everything would, would fall apart pretty quickly. Yeah, I think you mentioned here, you mentioned the cache key includes the, the file information of the inputs of an action. But something that's very important to mention is that the cache key also includes the command that you have to run. Mm-hmm. Because so, so that's very different from make, right? In the make world, you have a rule that invokes the compiler and you modify the make file to update the rule. Make will not know that and it will not reveal your output because it will have no idea that anything has changed. Whereas Bazel knows that the command that you had to type to build that output changed and it will rebuild it. And that ensures that we are always up to date with changes to the build files, which is actually pretty common and to the build rules. Mm-hmm. Um, and enforces this correctness aspect we like to mm-hmm. highlight in Bazel. It sounds... Yes, so- oh, sorry. Carry on, please. Uh, I was going to say, it sounds similar to how ccache works. It hashes the command line effectively and then the file and puts in the pre- mm-hmm. pre-processed things, too. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, so, so it's probably wrong. Does it suffer from the same problem that other caching systems I'm familiar with, like ccache does, where if the directory structure changes slightly, like I'm building in Jason's directory, but Rob is building in Rob's directory, then it sees those as two different artifacts, and then it has a hard time sharing the cache? I, I think we think to... think... Go ahead. Uh, I was about to say that I don't think we suffer from the same problem, although I'm not very familiar with Ccache. Okay. So I'm not ever... I mean, I'm sure we don't, right? We can reuse build artifacts in different client machines and different environments. So I think, I don't know the details exactly, but I'm pretty sure we go to great extents to use relative paths to the mm-hmm. workspace so that the command lines remain stable across users and directories. Um, now my brain is coming online. Do I remember correctly that Ccache works by caching artifacts uh, built by one developer for the other developer? That is the main goal of Ccache, but it has been getting better over the last few years to be able to more, more correctly handle relative <coughs> paths so you can do a shared cache of some sort. Okay, so this is why, so in that case we don't suffer from, from this failure mode because we have a, we don't, so we don't do cross-user caching. Bazel only does caching on the same workstation, and the rest of the caching Bazel delegates to the remote execution system. Right, but an action that can run a compiler invocation, which when I say action, I mean a compiler invocation, for example, right? That can run on a remote machine. It can also run in, this, in your local machine, and they will have the same command line because mm-hmm. of these relative paths. Right. It doesn't matter where the remote machine run, in which directory it run the action, because it doesn't matter. Right, we go to it. Uh, correct, although... That's technically correct, but if you don't cache um, actions between different developers, then you are not open to yes. small differences between their setups. For example, the aforementioned compiler version issue. Or attacks, right? You don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just don't populate the remote cache with local invocations, right? We just rely on CI to do that for us. And then Absolutely. we trust yes. that the CI machines are well managed and secure and then you will not have interference between users. So there's some sort of, so so if I build it on my system and it's some artifact that doesn't already exist, I don't push that up to a shared location. I'm only able to pull down something that was already from a known good location. Did I say that right? That's right, but the thing is, to clarify, that's only if you were to use remote caching. But right. the thing is we always, or pretty much always use remote execution as well. So when you said, I built this on my workstation, it really didn't happen in your workstation. It happened on a remote machine that's trusted. The oh. machine knows oh. exactly what the action looks like and generates the output for you and you download it later if you want it. So, so does, yeah, go ahead. How does that work for me? I'm just sitting here at my laptop right now and I want to build. Can I build locally still? It will feel like it does build locally, but it's not if you have enabled these features. Right? They are not enabled by default because that's they require okay. some setup of a remote execution engine of which there are multiple open source implementations right we don't have our own and people have done their own so you can just either use some of the shelf if you want to deploy it yourself or use some companies that offer that um but yeah it, it will feel as if you were building locally it's just the actions happen in another machine okay interesting yeah 
Uh, can we talk a little bit about Bazel support for, for libraries? I, I read a little bit about how uh, it kind of knows what a library is versus what make as kind of the alternative. Um, and also uh, what sort of support Bazel might have for package manager, I'm curious about. Um, the first question is easier. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, they, uh, so that's a bit of a uh, historical uh, fortunate accident or the person who invented this would probably disagree, disagree with this assessment that we differentiate libraries and binaries pretty well. So we have usually when you write language support for Bazel, you write at least two kinds of rules, language underscore library and then language underscore binary. Um, okay. And you probably also want to add language underscore test. Mm. Okay. So there's no confusion. Does this answer the first question? I think, that's I think so. So you you kind of can treat multiple libraries as dependencies, and, and Bazel is able to figure all that out. Correct. Okay. I think that's a huge benefit of Bazel, right? It has this semantical information about what you're building. Its rule knows if it's a binary, it's a library, it's a test, it's a documentation artifact, it's a zip file, whatever, right? It's kind of encoded in the build rules, and your build files are higher level than what they would be in Make, because Make just kind of tracks file dependencies, and you can have these phony targets in between to aggregate things, but Make doesn't know, right? It's harder to express these kind of concepts. Yes, and the other thing is that uh, Bazel uh, will transitively tell your dependencies and build them if you need them, and only build those. In a sense, this is similar to Make. Okay. So with package managers, uh, you know, in the C++ community, we've had a lot of uh, work over the past few years with Conan and VC package. Does does Bazel work with either of those? Not to the best of my knowledge. Uh, so the reason why this is a bit of a uh, sensitive subject is that because given Bazel's monorepo heritage, um, mm. we don't haven't emphasized package manager support yet. We do support some things because we know that there is a need. I mean, Maven is a good example, but that's Java and C++. But the, I mean, the, the issue I personally see is that uh, a lot of these package managers work by, find, work by having a cache in your home directory somewhere mm -hmm. and uh, keeping state per user. And what Bazel prefers to do is to keep state per project so that projects don't contaminate each other. Okay. And for some package managers, that's easy to, uh, these, two are, these two are easy to reconcile. From some package managers, it's not. But so I'm curious what you were asking, how, sorry, you asked, your question was, how does Bazel interact with these package managers? And I would ask, what does interact mean? What do you have in mind? Yeah, that's what I was just kind of thinking along those those the lines of that. So with like Conan specifically, because that's the one I'm most familiar with, say Conan install this project with the or you know, with this um compiler if I want to. So there's a couple of different ways of going about this. With CMake, I can say I can run a CMake script that just automatically interacts with Conan and then CMake just has available to it the libraries that were just installed for that project for Conan. But I can see if you did Conan more in a manual perspective where you said, oh, Conan, please package manager, install these four things, then the only question remaining is, is there a way inside of Bazel to say, look in these four directories for these four dependencies because I've already installed them. So I know Conan, I mean, excuse me, Bazel sounds like it, I mean, it prefers the mono repo thing, but it can work with external dependencies if you need it to, right? That's a very good assessment of the situation. Okay. So we would just, you would just need some the legwork to say this is the best way to tell Bazel how to find my Conan installed dependencies. Um, or else ask Conan to install the dependencies in some way that's reachable to Bazel. Right. Yeah, it tends, it does have it in its own, like, hashed directory that's 14 levels deep in your home directory kind of thing. It's, yeah, it's not trivial, but it has been done. I mean, I think the obvious example are the CUDA libraries, um, but the NVIDIA ships, and we have to use them from wherever they are, and basically can do that. I don't know how it works, but it's definitely possible to use external dependencies. Okay. It's not as natural as you might want yet, 
but it, it works, right? It's, an, it's a need for the open source community. So we have to support that in some way. Right. Okay. What is Bazel itself uh, written in? I think you mentioned Java and C++. That's um, right. Mostly, okay. mostly Java with a bit of C++. And I believe the tool to, to invoke the correct version of Bazel called Bazel is, is written in Golang. And we have shell and Python snippets in some obscure places that we pretty much don't want to have. For, before you ask, I mean, this sounds crazy, but keep in mind that Blaze, or in, yeah, Blaze, I'm saying Blaze correctly, the internal version of Bazel before Bazel existed mm -hmm. was started around 2006, I think, 7? Seven? 7, I believe 7, but maybe 6. Yeah. Definitely not so 8. The state of C++ at the time wasn't as good as it is today. And the amount okay. of languages we could use inside Google was pretty limited, but blessed languages, as I was mentioning before. So <laughs> Java was really the only reasonable choice between those to write this kind of native code. Um, today, I think we wouldn't choose that, but it's too late to change it, right? Basically, it's a gigantic piece of code, has a ton of logic, um, and supports a lot of use cases. Right? If you're writing something, it's difficult. No, it's, I, I agree. I think that when the choice of Java was made, uh, I, I, I don't think anyone expected uh, Blaze to handle a code base as big as it handles now. And I, I'm saying Blaze and not Bazel because uh, probably Google is the place where Blaze is put to the, Blaze is put to the, to use in the largest code base. And, and Java, sorry, go ahead. I'll finish up later. Uh, sorry? I was going to say that Java has caused a lot of friction, right, with users, but we have gone through a lot of efforts to hide that from our users. When you don't load a Bazel binary, you don't even know it's running in Java. Um, and we, it's kind of, we've bundled the GRE with the binary ships, so everything's kind of self-contained. Mm. Um, like, Linux distributions don't like that because they don't like this kind of self-packaging. But for you as a user, if you just download the binary, it will work for you without having to worry about Java at all. And then Bazel also has this internal client server model. It runs on your machine always, but the client is the thing that's written in C++ for super fast startup. And the server, which is the Java part, keeps running in the background for a few hours until it decides to exit to prevent, to mitigate this cost and to maintain state across builds. So the fact that it's Java um, may sound crazy, but in practice, it's not a big problem. Anyway. All right. I don't no, think it sounds I, I, crazy I, that it's Java. The only thing that would make me wonder is why five different programming languages or whatever you ultimately mentioned. Um, I think uh, I w it's mostly two because the Go is an optional tool. And mm -hmm. I think that Python and Shell are only used if you develop Bazel itself. Okay. And yeah. that's mostly for our convenience. Um, and even then, I, I, I wish we didn't have didn't have, for example, Python because it's just yet one more programming language. Right. Um, Shell is useful. Um, although Same it with does us. Cost, well, I just want to say that, but it does cause friction when we work on Windows. Um, I think uh, <laughs> we can't we can't uh, change the fact that it's written in Java anymore, and hmm. C++ is necessary because there are some things that Java cannot do. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask specifically. You said there's a performance consideration, but uh, what other reasons do you have C++ for part of it? Um, at that time, please carry on, Julio. No, I was on the go farther back in history as you were. Okay. I was going to say that today we have some JNI code for file system operations, for example. Okay. But Java has gotten much better at that, so it's possible we could even replace that code with Java NIO native calls now. I don't know. Yes. Yes, I was about to say that the first reason why we consider C++ is because at the time Java was not able to handle symbolic links. But then it turns out that, uh, for example, internally we use extended uh, X4 attributes, and I don't think Java can handle that even today. And or one I think more thing somebody that... pointed out to me two days ago that it can today. But maybe <laughs> we, Java 12 or whatever it is, so we can't use it yet. Bleep. Um, <laughs> Uh, there's another thing which uh, which is uh, very important for Bazel though, which is process control, because uh, if you run a build step and you and that build step is finished, or Bazel decides that it wants to terminate it, 
Um, it's important that it be able to terminate it, and it's important to be able to control what resources it has access to. And uh, for example, I personally did the part that does process control on Windows, and that just doesn't work in Java. Yeah, yeah, you need C to do those things, basically. Mm. Yep. So yes. I hate doing process control. <laughs> Me too. I'm not too much of it. But Brazil will have <laughs> JNI code. He will have JNI code that's linked into the binary directly, but we have, as Lucas was saying, this, what he mentioned about pro, uh, some process management, that's, those are separate tools that we bundle with Bazel. But they are native, and they actually wrap anything that we invoke. Like when you run GCC, we will invoke it through this kind of process wrapper thing that we have that makes sure that everything gets cleaned up or gets killed if it gets stuck or, you know, anything. It kind of sounds like everyone here who's had to deal with cross-platform process control, you, you hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I, it happens that that's, that's a universal problematic area. I, uh, I think I did, I did Windows process control. Uh, Julio worked a whole lot on OS X. And I think there was recently a thread about uh, some uh, very arcane details of Unix signals that we didn't quite get right. Oh, most certainly, yeah. <laughs> I, using, right. uh, I have used QProcess a lot uh, many years ago, and that's supposed to abstract all those things away for you, but I still ended up having to replace core pieces of it that didn't work quite how we needed them to. Anyhow. Yes, I think that uh, when, whenever I run into um, memory size issues or something that something that you cannot really easily do in Java, I kind of feel, feel myself wishing that, uh, find myself wishing that uh, we did everything we did in something else other than Java. But then I realized that if we had written Bazel in some other language, I would probably have the same feelings with that other language too. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Julio, we mentioned in, in your bio that you're actually going to be leaving the Bazel team soon, um, and you wrote this recent blog post about one of the uh, last bugs you were working on. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this? Oh, sure. I mean, it's very relevant to what we were just discussing yeah. with this GNI. Um, and it may be interesting to your um, I was say readers, but no, listeners, uh, which is we had some very obscure bug internally where someone was changing the AppSail library. If you haven't heard about AppSail, it's mm -hmm. a core library. Yeah, we've had Titus on here and okay. talked about Good. it, yeah. So they were trying to do an optimization that was very important because it was supposed to save many uh, resources. And the only tests that failed at Google, which are many of them, the only tests that failed were the ones for the Blaze on Mac. And that turned out to be because this specific version of Bazel was trying to dynamically load a couple of shared libraries, as J and I plugins. And both of these libraries depended on upsale separately. Uh, so we ended up having two copies of AppSail in memory mm -hmm. and control and AppSail was trying to do some deadlock detection and had internal state, state tracking for logs and control was jumping between these two copies of the library and things were not working. So this... Sounds right. Yeah. So <laughs> what I was trying to do, which sounds very easy, is like let's try to unify all the native libraries into one object so that we can reuse um, this shared piece of code, which sounds silly because if you were using dynamic libraries for everything this wouldn't be a problem but because we tried to statically link many things um, in our rules that's why we ended up two separate copies of upsale in different shared objects there was no common central piece of code where you could mm. deduplicate symbols um, yeah and this was seem easy enough uh, conceptually but in practice uh, it wasn't especially because of this friction we still have between Bazel externally and Blaze internally. And uh, I was touching the pieces where the two interact, and those are the most annoying ones to do with. So there's more details in the link that I shared. You can read in the notes later. Um, and yeah, I'll be trying something new. I've been at Google for a long time, and I'm about to start something new. I'm not going to unveil it where here, but you will know <laughs> soon. OK, very cool. Uh, Good luck in your future adventures. Yeah, definitely. Uh, one question I had is, you know, we've talked a lot about how Bazel works great for this, you know, gigantic monorepo that you have at Google. Um, 
is it a good build system to use if you're you know starting from scratch with a, a smaller project or is it you know harder to configure more setup required than something like make or cmake um i think uh, at the very simple size it's just as e just as easy okay um i think that the difficulty comes if you want to use features that make or cmake don't have um remote execution is a good example because then you need to think about what what tools you use on the remote nodes you have to figure out what to do when what how, how to do the same thing uh, between different developers and so on and so forth so it's more like uh, if you want to use a feature you have to pay for it we are trying to make it easy and straightforward though the one thing i would add is if you think that you will end up using more than one language in your project at any point then the visual investment will probably pay off and when i think more than one language it's not too hard to get into the territory, right? You have your C++ code for your binary or library, and then you have some shell scripts to test that. There you go. You have two languages already. How do you automate execution of the tests for each of these pieces? Right? Bazel gives you that very easily because you can combine these two different kind of artifacts and build rules in one project, and you can test everything at once. But if you end up with a language-specific package manager or build tool, it's very hard to integrate with other stuff right um yes, and the other thing was, anyway i was gonna say let plus rust whatever you want right rust for example has cargo which is amazing but as soon as you want to integrate any other language you can't mm. Mm. Interesting point. yes uh, what i would what i would like to add is that uh, bazel's integrated testing support is a big boon because if you if you say bazel test and the list of tests you want to run um that those tests get run no matter which language they are written in the results get collated in a single list and you get all sorts of neat features for example automatic retrying or fl of flaky test or running tests multiple times if you think a test is flaky and so on and so forth yeah we like to think of basil as a build tool but really as i've heard other people in the team say it's a test tool right testing is a super important part of a project and Bazel's abilities for testing are pretty amazing. So. I think uh, while we're running low on time, but a question that I still have is, are there any like publicly facing projects from Google that are big projects that use Bazel that we are all aware of? Like, I don't know, is it uses for Chromium or something like that? Or I think the biggest no. one is TensorFlow at the moment. TensorFlow, OK. And there's another one that I'm forgetting now. Other than upsell, of course, uh, but um, do you remember? Do you mean maybe Envoy Proxy? I don't know. I haven't followed much, unfortunately. But, okay. Yeah. Um, also, I was also just curious. You know, since it became open source, are you aware of any large projects, you know, outside of Google that converted from some other build system to Bazel? And what that process may have been like for them. I think the example that comes to mind right now is Twitter. They announced in a mailing list right before coronavirus started, I think, that they were switching from Pants to Basil. Um, I don't know how that's going for them. It needs a big transition probably for a large code base. And I know other companies have tried, but I haven't. But the British look is much better. So I want to mention a tool called Buck by Basil by Facebook here which while it's a separate tool it's uh, pretty much a speed speed to our sibling of Bazel and uh, um, we when when Bazel started out uh, we met with the folks over there pretty frequently to make sure that we to make sure to learn from each other and to make sure that the two tools are at least approximately look sim approximately look the same okay uh, Jason, anything else you want to add before we let him go? I don't believe so. Okay. Well, it was great having you both on the show today to tell us all about Basil. Uh, where can people find you online? Um, my email address is uh, lberki at google.com. And I am a bit of an online hermit because I don't have a uh, Twitter handle. I don't have a significant social media presence. Uh, what else I don't have? 
<laughs> You're maybe the Google smartest it. of us all here then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I have too much of it. So my online username has always been JMMV. That's two M's there. Uh -huh. so my, that's my Twitter handle. And also jmmv.dev, yes, that's my blog page. And you can find out my contact details there. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks for inviting us. And have a nice um, day, I believe. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having us, of course.